Well, today as we uh, continue our series in String of Pearls, we're going to again dive into the Old Testament and find a way in which Jesus, in a series of parables that we know quite well, they're pretty well traveled, but we may not realize that in the midst of these parables, Jesus is stringing together some incredible pearls of wisdom from the Old Testament. So what we're going to do is I want to grab some of those pearls, but instead of just setting them here, I want to read them to you as they come out of the, uh, the Bible and have them in the back of your mind as we're going through the parables Jesus has today. So in the Bible, all kinds of pearls of wisdom. We'll look at four of them today. We'll pull them out. And one of our first pearls is coming from Jeremiah, looks like. We have two from Jeremiah today. Jeremiah 23, 29. We have another uh, pearl of wisdom Jesus will reference from Genesis 26, verse 12. We have another one from Jeremiah, this one from Jeremiah chapter 4. And we have one more coming out of Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. And Jesus will amazingly string together these four pearls and bring meaning to them all in the context of a story to show what it looks like to apply Jeremiah, Hosea, Genesis, and another Jeremiah, all in one short, one paragraph story. Let me give you the verses, and you may be clued in to where we're headed. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, do not sow among the thorns. So several things get struck here. First, the word break. We need to break up the ground. Also, we need to not sow among the thorns. Sound familiar? I'll give you another one. In the book of Hosea, it says, Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. But in order to do that, you've got to break up the fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till He comes and rains righteousness upon you. I'll give you another one. From Genesis chapter 26, verse 12, God's blessing upon Isaac. Isaac sowed in that land, and he reaped the same year, but what he reaped was unheard of. It was a hundredfold impact or harvest to what he invested, and the Lord blessed him. One more in Jeremiah. God said, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord? Is it not like a hammer that can break the rock in pieces? Jesus is going to have these and probably many others in the back of his mind as he's going to tell us that he sees God's word as a fire and a rock. A fire and a rock that can bring self-awareness to your life as you work more and more in sync with God and his spirit. But also an incredible, miraculous amount of spiritual productivity can come into your life if you begin to use God's word as both a fire and a hammer. What does it look like? How do we do that? Well, Jesus will tell three parables, and they will become increasingly clear or unclear, depending on whether or not we have the code to understand the pearls he's putting together. Let's begin with the first parable. And again, he began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him. So he got into a boat. He sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. And he taught them many things by parables. And he said to them in his teaching, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened that as he sowed, that some of the seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some, on the other hand, fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth. Immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Now some seed fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it. And it yielded no crop. Now other seeds fell on the good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up. It increased. It produced some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, many of us have heard this parable. I love the reaction to the disciples. They hear the parable, and pretty much their reaction is, what does that have to do with anything? So I want you to notice, he begins the parable by saying, listen, and he ends the parable by saying, if you have ears to hear, let him hear. 
He's saying there's a way that we lean into the Bible. In other words, you don't just read the Bible. You let the Bible read you. But Jesus wanted you to look at a parable and ask yourself, let it read you. Am I the stony soil? Am I the thorny soil? Am I the shallow soil? Do I have good soil? Like a good salesman, Jesus has embedded in this this incredible benefit as to why you'd want to dig into it. He says, if you will move your heart from thorny or, or shallow soil to good soil, what God wants to do in your heart is to produce a hundredfold crop. And before he tells us what that is, he says, so, don't just read the Bible. Listen, have ears to hear. Let it read you and speak into you and examine you and change you. And notice this phrase, hundredfold. The audience would have heard this and been like a gasp. Oh, a hundredfold. I haven't heard of a hundredfold since, since Genesis. It's the only time the phrase is used. Back in Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. A hundredfold blessing was the blessing, the ultimate blessing that God would pour his blessing upon Isaac to show the covenant had moved from Abraham to Isaac, that God was with him, that he got a hundredfold. And God is saying, if you will use my word as a hammer and as a fire to till the soil of your hearts, what God will do in your life will have a hundredfold impact, not just for you, but for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, but it requires us to do something to listen in a particular way, to hear in a particular way. In fact, he goes on and he clarifies what he means. He was alone and those around him, the twelve, asked him about the parable. And he said to them, like, what, what, what does that mean? He said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. So that, notice this, seeing they may not see. In other words, there's a way to see things, but not really see it or not really incorporate into your life. There's a way to perceive or listen, but not really hear it and understand it and incorporate it into your life. And and here's how you know if you have really seen. Here's how you know if you've really heard. Here's how you know if you've come to a sermon or a Bible study or a radio broadcast or a personal devotion. Here's how you know if you've had ears to hear. That at the end of it, you have something you want to turn from. Oh, my goodness. God has revealed to me a thorn. God has revealed to me a shallowness. God has shown me a rock in my life. You didn't just hear the sermon, good sermon. didn't read the passage, interesting insights. You let it read you and you said, oh, there's something I need to turn from. There's something I need to let go of. There's something I need to change. And yet it's not guilt and shame. There's also a sense of forgiveness. That you know you've been forgiven of it, but... Because you've been forgiven of it, you want to get rid of it. Now, if you're coming to a parable and you do not have something you can identify that you want to change, if you do not have something that you want to turn from or need to be forgiven from, you probably haven't yet listened to the parable. They did a study. I think it was a New Zealand psychologist. did a study of human beings and our capacity for hearing truth. He calls the problem that all of us face vain brain. Vain brain. That we are so confident that we're right that we don't hear things that are contrary to our preconceived ideas. He said we round ourselves up. I think it was 78% of people said they thought they perceived truth better than other people. 78%. We have a tendency to minimize our wrongdoing and maximize our right doing. And what he calls filtering out feedback, he said the human ego is so protective of itself. It wants to stay away from shame or guilt or contrary opinions that it isolates itself through what he calls vain brain and says, I'm not going to let new data get in. Well, if that's true, then it's certainly true of us as well. When we come to the Bible, God is trying to read us and speak into us and challenge us and convict us. And yet if we just cursorily walk through a passage and go, oh, good sermon. We didn't listen. In fact, based on what he said in the previous passage here, the only wise thing that you could do, the only wise thing that I can do, is to come to a passage with this assumption. I need to assume I'm blind, and I need to assume that I'm not only not listening, but not seeing. 
In other words, if I, if I go along the normal track, I'm just going to become a, a bad listener and a bad seer. But if I come to a passage and say, wait a second, as I heard that sermon today, I thought of my wife and how she needs to work on this. Oh, and my son. Oh, and my mother. Oh, I wish my mother. I've got to send my mother the CD. That's the human brain. Instead to say, wait, I need to bend and open my will and say, God, what do you want to say to me? I'm in this passage. And I'm blind to it. I'm in this passage, but I cannot hear it. God, please take off my blinders. Give me the environment of grace that I would hear the challenge you have for me today. The only wise thing, both from the Bible and from psychology, is that we've got to presume that we're blind and presume that we're not hearing. And we need to go out of our way to get access to the truth. He tells a second parable. The second parable sounds just like the first parable with a few more details to explain it to them. He said to them, do you not understand the parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Guys, I'm entrusting to you the kingdoms of heaven. You're my 12. You've been around me the whole time. If you're not getting it, wow. But really, the, the key to understanding Jesus' parables is to understand he's always referencing the Old Testament. So here he gives us a few more clues. The sower sows the word. It's the word of God going out. These are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear it, Satan comes immediately and takes the word that is sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on the stony ground. When they hear the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. But because of those stones, there's not enough area for growth to occur. They have no root in themselves. So they endure only for a little while. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. For these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, but they don't listen. Because the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things, enter in and choke out that word. And it becomes unfruitful or unproductive or doesn't take root. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, apply the word, incorporate the word, integrate the word, accept it. It bears fruit. Some it will bear for 30 fold, some 60 fold and some a hundred fold. Again, Jesus begins to say, which soil are you? Now, historically, Christians come to passages like this and they start asking questions I don't think the original audience was asking. Now, who in here is a real Christian? Who in here is not a real Christian? We spend all our time in these theoretical discussions about who's in heaven and did they lose their salvation or did they not? When the point of the passage is which soil is not they, them, your neighbor, your friend, your uncle, your next door, some theoretical person. The question is, as a Christian, which soil am I today? God is right now throwing out seed into your heart and into your life. The question is, as the seed is going out, which soil are you right now? Are you right now so burdened with the cares of this world, with the deceitfulness of other idols, be it riches or be it whatever, that you're not able to let God challenge you in some areas of your life? Are you able to hear things that are good, but not you're filtering out the things that God wants to really challenge, the deeper things of your life, so you don't endure when real difficulty comes your way? The question is not whose soil is someone else, but who's, which soil am I? There's a uh, couple references here to a couple more of these pearls. This idea of breaking up the ground yourself. Here again, I think we see Jeremiah 4, 3 to 4. That the call of God to let that seed begin to work in your life is that you and I need to take the Bible and use it to break up the fallow ground. We need to be able to push the thorns and burn the thorns out of our life. That God would allow his truth to grow up in us and to grow us through that. But we've got to do some work to prepare our hearts, to toil our hearts to prepare for it. We've got to break up the fallow ground. Sow for yourself righteousness, reap in mercy. Do you want to reap more mercy and compassion and hope and joy in your life? Wouldn't we all want that? Then you've got to do something. You've got to break up the fallow ground. You've got to till the soil of your heart every day. 
Say, today I'm, I'm deceitful. Today I'm blocking out stuff I need to hear. God, I want to presume I'm blind. God, I want to presume I'm deaf. Speak to me. Search me and know me. God, help me. Help me overcome my defensiveness. Help me overcome my lack of teachability. Help me overcome my tendency to, to push away or, or discount things that I, that I don't like to hear or that don't go with my preconceived ideas. I'm breaking up the fallow ground. I remember when I was uh, in Atlanta, we bought our first house. And our house came with a luxury carport. And what is a luxury carport? Well, uh, I didn't know, um, except that my house sat in one position, and then my, my carport was just behind it. But instead of being a one-car carport, they made enough concrete for two cars, but the second place for the carport, you couldn't drive into. It was actually behind my house. So you could never get to the second part of the carport, well, we decided to add to our house because we had our second child. And I had to break up the concrete in the second portion of the slab in my carport. So what do you do when you need to do that? I headed to Home Depot and I rented a 220 volt jackhammer. I'll never forget going out there with this jackhammer, getting right along the line where the addition of my house that my dad and I were, and my father-in-law were going to build in a few uh, weeks were coming. And I got out the jackhammer, plugged it in the 220 line of my, uh, my dryer vent because they actually had my washer dryer outside in the carport. Don't even ask why that was. And I have my jackhammer. And, and, and I notice that the concrete's not breaking. I'm just moving. And then I had to step on And it's starting to break up. And I realized, here's how you know you're in a luxury carport. They didn't just put in two inches of concrete. They didn't just put six inches of concrete. They didn't even put 12 inches of concrete. They didn't just put 24 inches of concrete. The place I was cutting through had over 27 inches of concrete. Boom, 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 boom. Hours I'm breaking this thing up. And oh my goodness, the chunks I'm carrying are humongous. I'm carrying this stuff out. And all because, in order to make the pitch of the roof work, I need the concrete level to be two inches lower. But I had to take all this out in order to make the pitch work of the roof line and all these pieces. Oh, at the end of the day, I'm exhausted. The whole rest of the day, people are talking to me. How are you doing, Chip? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm doing really, 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 really good. It took me a week to recover. It's hard work to break up the ground at great cost, using tools that I wasn't used to, part of which I enjoyed, part of which I didn't, the lingering impact of it. And that's what happens when you're going to use the Bible to break up ground that's been hard for generations. Your grandparents kept that ground hard. They haven't thought about their own anger issues or their impatience. And that hardened the ground for your parents. And they didn't till the ground. So you have inherited generational patterns. And the question is, will your grandkids inherit what you inherited? Or will you be the one? That chooses to break up the ground. So the hundredfold blessing will not just be for you now, but will be for your kids and grandkids. And will you take the blessings of what your parents and grandparents did and say, look at the work they did. How could I not pass on the work to others? Break up the ground. Which soil am I? What areas am I filtering out feedback from my spouse, my kids, my employees, my boss, my God? Well, after telling the second parable, Jesus launches into a third parable. Theoretically, to clarify, <laughs> the third parable goes like this. He said to them, it is a lamp or it is a lamp not to be brought and put under a basket or under a bed. Is it not to be set on a lampstand? And if you're on the disciples, maybe you're like, like me, you're going, this is not helpful. We were just talking about soil and seed. And now we're talking about lamps and beds and lampstands. For there is nothing which will, be, will not be revealed when you use a lamp, nor anything that was secret that would not come to life or light. If anyone, here's the phrase again, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. I'm straining Jesus. What in the world are you talking about? Now, one of the problems is we come to a phrase like lamp and we imagine somebody plugging it in. Whoop. We go, okay, they don't have lamps back then. 
they had fire burning or oil burning lamps. And so he says, when you have a lamp, you use a lamp for something. You don't go hide it. It's a useful tool. It's a tool used for burning. And when you understand how they cleared their fields in the days of Jesus and before, you begin to understand how these three parables come together because they're all tied to this pearl Jesus is linking together from Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. Is not my word like a fire that you would put in a lamp? Is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces that is in your field? Here's a field that we got a chance to walk around in both in 2012 and also this year, uh, last year, 2014. So around this field, lots of thorns. We were asked to go and take rocks out of the field, and it's almost impossible because the brush and the thorns are so massive because you go to reach in and grab a rock, it's like, oh, ow, oh, there's just no way to get to it because the thorns are so thick. You've got to first get rid of the thorns, the pressures, the distractions, the, the idols in your life that are keeping you from even getting access to these things. So here's how you clear the thorns before you go and break up the rocks. If you're a farmer, you take the lamp and you begin to burn it. You've probably seen people burn fields. You're clearing the rubbish. Well, in the same way, you take the lamp. You don't hide it under a bed. You take it out in your field and you light it. It begins to burn. You light a little bit more and it burns. It begins to burn off all the thorns. And after the thorns are cleared, all of a sudden it's so much easier to get down and touch the rocks. Because now there's no thorns in the way. So you first use the lamp to burn away the brush. Then you use the word as a hammer. We were asked to go out into the field and to find rocks. Some would look like they're real small. So it'd be like you reach there and pluck it right out. Other times they would look small and then you would get down on one knee and you'd brush it off. You'd brush it off. You'd find out the rock was about so big. And it was not one inch into the dirt. It was six inches, eight inches into the dirt. You had to get a stick. You're prying. You're trying to find the edges of this thing. You're pushing. You're prying. And finally, you get this rock out. It took you a lot longer to get it out. You found yourself sort of weighing it and bringing it over to a big pile where you threw it on the ground. But all of a sudden, this area that looked like it was an inch, two inches, maybe three, you discovered that it was actually blocking a productivity of the field that was more like 18 inches by six inches, ten. Think of all of the productive fruit-bearing fields that will come out of this spot that once was a rock. And what Jesus is saying here with these three parables that seem disconnected is that as a follower of Christ, I use God's word as a hammer i use it as a a fire to burn and challenge me what are the idols in my life the things that i have made more important than him i let that burn up those things and then i take his word i say god what do you want to hammer away at you say do all things without grumbling and complaining Ugh. i usually dismiss that verse why do i have such a grumbling complaining attitude and i pull out the word and i begin to hammer away why is that Why have I developed a spirit of ungratitude and being unappreciative despite living in the most successful and freest time in the history of the world? I began to ask myself, I've had a pattern of that. What did I see patterned by my parents or grandparents? What did I see patterned in my family? This rock's got to come out. And I'm going to do the work to break it up. Sometimes it's going to require some journaling. Sometimes it's going to require somebody you trust who loves you to help you. But it says, I'm going to use the Bible not as a place to increase my knowledge of Bible trivia. But I'm going to use it as a tool, as a hammer, as a fire in my life to dig and culminate into greater fertile soil. I want to have the good soil, but I've got to do the work. Back here in this pile, Beth and I were there in 2012. We came back again in 2014. And we were asked to share stories. And my wife shared a story that when we were there in 2012, she was going through a severe depression. So she came upon this rock. It was a big one. She asked me if I would come down and help her. We spent about 20 minutes digging, finding the edges of this rock. She's had depression in her family for generations. 
She, and in fact, I didn't think she'd be going on the trip because of the depression, how it had been impacting her, whether it was physically or psychologically, if she's prepared for it. But she said, I, I want to try. We sat out there in this field in the middle of nowhere, and we began to dig together. We began to pry together. We began to find edges together. We then got this rock out. We tipped it up on its edge, and we pushed it over. Thump. We picked it up. Thump. We made it all the way over to this pile that you saw earlier in the picture. Two years later, she shared with our group, a new group that was there, that same pile, that same field. And she said, let me tell you, my husband and I went through a difficult time of trying to deal with something that's been in my life for generations. And I cannot tell you the freedom that I have today that I didn't have two years ago. I am so glad that we, we did the work. We battled the challenges of, of, of grace and truth and acceptance and challenge and intervention and all those weird things that you do when you're trying to walk with someone toward wholeness. But she said, I'm so f- much freer today than I am. I remember thinking to myself, boy, think how much freer Beth would be if her grandparents had made this decision. <laughs> or her parents had made this decision. But he has ears to hear, let him hear. You, you can't change what your parents have done, or your husband is going to do, or your wife's going to do. But you can change what you're going to do. You can decide today. I'm going to use the hammer, and I'm going to use the fire, because I want to be free. Not only do I want to be free, I want generations to be free. That's why when you came in today, we gave you a rock. Look what this says in this passage Jesus ends us with. He said to them, take heed. Now hear this word, listen. Take heed. Have ears to hear. How are your ears doing this morning? Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. If you listen well, God will give well. If you will dig deep, God will grow tall. To you who hear, who apply, who work, who burn, who dig, more will be given. In other words, you become self-aware and God gives you the gift of more self-awareness. Oh, wow, the freedom here. Why would I not want to pull out more rocks? Why would I not want more freedom in my life? I don't want to be somebody who becomes increasingly less open, increasingly more more closed-minded, increasingly more, more grumpy as I grow older in my life? What if instead I become a digger and a burner? And I go, wow, look at the freedom, God. I want more of this. Or, to him, for whoever has listening ears, more will be given. But whoever does not have listening ears, whoever does not allow the word to change them and cultivate them and read them, even what he has will be taken away from him. I hear that. Even what you have will be taken away. Which means it's better to not read the Bible than to read it and not want to be changed. Because when you read the Bible and it just becomes a book that you critique, a book that you pull trivia out of, a book that you pull information out of, you lose even what you had. Your love for the Scripture goes down. Your your in-touchness with God goes down. Your ability to hear from God goes down. Why? Because you create a callous. You create a pattern of saying, yeah, the Bible, it's something I like to critique. Sermons, it's like something I like to say. That was good or bad. That was an A. That was a C. I'm not against being evaluated. I mean, I'm fine with you evaluating me. I'm talking about what's going on in your heart. Are you letting God challenge you? If you were to summarize Jesus saying in a shorter phrase, it might be, use it or lose it. Use the Bible to challenge you and you'll be given more. But if you become callous to the Bible, then every time you hear it, it will increasingly be ineffective in challenging you. So you came in today, we gave you a rock. And I want to ask you to clear a rock for yourself and a future generation. Is it shame? Is it about self-image? I want to invite the band to come up for this next song. It's an invitation about clearing rocks. Is it anger? Is it fear? Is it addiction? Is it pornography? Is it judgmentalism? Self-righteous? We heard the story when we were out in the fields that day. 
happened about 10 plus years earlier. Our leader had taken a, a teacher out with a class. He found a rock, but it wasn't this big or this big. It was about so big. They only had a half hour before they had to move on, but he began to find the edges of this thing. He got down, and as he made his way and found the edges, the thing was massive. He clearly was having something God was doing in him. He began to weep as he began to find the edges, and, and his motions and his, his nonverbals were clearly showing something was happening. He got sticks, and he's prying, and he's prying, and the thing's not coming out. It's been 20 minutes, it's been 25 minutes, it's been 30 minutes. So the students came over to help. Hey, hey, miss, mister, can we help you? No, get away from me. I've got to do this myself. Oh, wow. Okay. They began to pray. He dug and he dug and he dug. It took him over an hour. And he finally got to the edge and he pulled this thing up in this massive rock. He had to push it end over end all the way across the field. He finally pushed it into this big old pile. He said, I'm sorry I lost my temper. I'm sorry I reacted the way I did. God just told me today is the day I've got to get the bitterness toward my father out of my field. And I had to dig. And for me, this was a physical manifestation of what I needed to get out. And they prayed for him that he would have the ability to forgive his father for not being really emotionally available, for not being the kind of encourager, the kind of friend that he needed as a, as a child. He'd return a few years later, tell an amazing story. Uh, he had come back and God had given him forgiveness for his father. You know, he restored a relationship with a dad he hadn't talked to for years and years and years. But his dad was aging now and heading toward the end of his life. His dad and he not only became friends and began to talk, but dad moved in with him. Moved into an apartment above his garage. And they built a relationship and his kids got to know their grandfather for the first time in a long time. Before he passed away a few years later. And he would say to you what I would say to you and say to us. It's hard work to break up ground, but it's worth it to be free. So the band does this last song. Why don't we all stand together? I'm going to have a prayer over us. You just want to stand with me. And during this song, there's no pressure, but let me tell you, you've got thousands of rocks in your field. I know I do. If you feel prompted, you want to come down during this song and just stop by the wheelbarrow and take the rock and throw it in and say, God, this is the rock. I want to commit to taking out my field starting today. Let me pray for us. Father, I ask right now that your Holy Spirit will just extend grace, that we're all safe here, we're all accepted here, we're all loved here. You are not surprised by the rocks that you have brought to our attention this morning. But God, I ask you to challenge us that we would walk out today as an individual, as a family, as a father, as a community with less rocky field. In Jesus' name, amen. Whenever you feel prompted, and I'll go first. You know, now all four services of our church have been through this exercise. Makes me wonder what God will do if a hundredfold blessing comes, not only to you and your life, but to all of us. So this will be the last time we get a chance to truck rocks out of here. So may God bless you. May God forgive you. May God go with you. And we'll see you all next week.